Hello friends, I hope you have had an opportunity to listen to my past 10 discussions and iterations about some of the paradigm shifts in intensive care, including some which did not shift, some unique concepts which did not translate into clinical benefit. And I also spoke about how the whole paradigm of critical care training and uh, the approach to a critical care program has changed over the last 20 years that I have been associated with this dynamic speciality. <clears throat> Today, I thought I'll talk about some interesting concept that is things which are considered to be essential for life. You can call them the elixirs of, li of a human life, which can turn poisonous if the concentration or if the proportion actually crosses a particular limit. I would like to call it elixirs turned poisons. You may also call it a friend turned foe, which is not uncommon in current day life. So let's look at the first elixir, you know, uh, which is can be poisonous and more and more understanding has happened, uh, has occurred on this field and that's about IV fluids. You know that when a patient is hemodynamically unstable, when a patient is intravascularly volume depleted, you need to give them fluids. And even a patient with a cardiac issue who is hemodynamically unstable could benefit with a small aliquot of fluid. But this particular elixir, as we have realized over the last 10 years or so, could be poisonous to the patient in terms of worsening lung function, worsening kidney function, and of course contributing to the global interstitial perfusion syndrome. So how do you identify when this elixir turns into a poison is the trick of effective and efficient hemodynamic optimization. So a judicious combination of chart reviews, use of lung ultrasound and the use of echocardiography and the right ventricular assessment have been the mainstays of assessing the fluid overload status of critically ill patients who have received a, fluid, a large volume of fluid resuscitation. But with the advances in point of care ultrasound, a combination of measurement of intra-abdominal pressure and the use of the VEXUS protocol seems to be the way you can identify when this particular friend becomes your enemy in the blink of an eye. So this is the first elixir which probably can turn into poison. While on the topic, we can also talk about a probably related uh, elixir or friend that is sodium. Sodium is an integral part of all membrane activity. It is a part of all membrane potentials and it is an integral part of the fluid drags that happen across cellular uh, channels and in the renal uh, apparatus. So <clears throat> sodium is an integral part of, of maintenance of the vascular tone. It is a part of the regulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. But this particular friend or elixir can turn four if it, it goes on either side of the normal C divide. You have a patient who is hyponatremic, who is acutely hyponatremic. We all know the consequences of that situation. And somebody who is persistently hyponatremic can have a wide variety of manifestations, mainly neurological, neuropsychiatric, and sometimes cardiac. And when you try to reverse this problem, the excess sodium you give can also turn to be a poison when the sodium overshoots at a much rapid pace. Although the previously held notion that acute symptomatic hyponatremia also should be corrected very slowly is now given up, and rapid bolus correction is now an accepted norm, of treating symptomatic severe hyponatremia. Overshoot is known to produce osmotic demyelination and that can be a catastrophic consequence. <clears throat> At the same time, <clears throat> when patients are <clears throat> given a lot of sodium containing stuff like antibiotics, for example, or given diuretics, for example, or lose a lot of water, they tend to become hypernatremic. And while we understand the dangers of hyponatremia, <clears throat> and the difficulties in correcting uh, hyponatremia rather too fast, we also should understand that the same disaster can happen with hypernatremia as well. Osmotic demyelination can also happen with hypernatremia and can also happen with the correction of hypernatremia. So again here, a daily chart review, the major, the, a, a meticulous assessment of the patient's volume status and attention to sodium is something which is very essential in preventing this elixir 
from turning uh, into a poison or this friend from turning into a foe. So while fluids and sodium are looking at the hemodynamic aspects, the other essential aspect of intensive care is oxygen, is oxygenation and ventilation. So we all are worried about hypoxemia. We tend to give a lot of oxygen to our patients and most pro protocols of ass re uh, no, uh, assessing and optimizing patients who come with emergency uh, uh, problems to hospitals begin with administration of oxygen. But how often do these patients who come into the emergency room actually need oxygen? And how much of oxygen is too much of oxygen? We never know. We all know that the body has adaptive mechanisms for hypoxemia. You know that people living in high altitude can adapt to high oxygen, low oxygen levels. But the human body does not or has not yet developed a system for adapting to hyperoxemia. And that's because hyperoxemia is not the norm. You are not expected to have more than normal oxygen in your blood. And oxygen, while low levels of it can cause disasters like hypoxemic brain injury, myocardial ischemia and the like, hyperoxia can also produce a lot of damage in the form of superoxide radicals. And oxygen free radical induced damage is much more widespread, much more catastrophic and much more dangerous than what can happen with borderline hypoxemia. So over the last five, six years, there have been a lot of studies which have looked at conservative oxygen targets, meaning to keep the PaO2 between 60, 60 to 80 or the saturation around about 90% in the non-trauma, non-pregnant, non-cardiogenic shock patient. And the results are not bad. And so many studies, the hot ICU, the hot ER, the oxygen ICU, the ICU rock study, they've all examined this paradigm and they've all understood that this elixir called oxygen could actually cause harm to the patients if you give it uh, over enthusiastically in situations where it is not really indicated. So oxygen, while we understand is an essential uh, elixir of life, has to be carefully titrated and that brings into focus the need for an oxygen prescription just like we have understood that now you need to prescribe IV fluids, we also need to prescribe oxygen. How much oxygen? At what rate? What are your targets? How to de-escalate? And what to watch for? These are some of the things which probably will prevent the oxygen as a friend from turning into oxygen as a foe. So fluids, sodium and oxygen are the three topmost elixirs which can turn poisonous if we don't pay attention to the rapidity and the quantum of the delivery of these elixirs. Whenever you have a patient in the ICU who's got a little bit of fluid, you feel that he's edematous or you find a couple of B lines for the lung ultrasound, we tend to give these patients diuretics. While that may be good enough to achieve that neutral balance or that little bit of negative balance, you desire in such patients, it is also likely that the diuretics themselves, which can actually uh, cause, convert an oliguric AKI into a non-oliguric uh, uh, syndrome, can actually cause more harm to the kidneys. So diuretics uh, on the, uh, not only can cause harm in terms of tubular uh, mechanisms, but can also cause electrolyte disturbances and can also cause some amount of derangements to the pancreatic function. So these diuretics, while are elixirs in the context of cardiogenic pulmonary edema and the grossly fluid overloaded patient with intact GFR, can be poisonous if you are using it in a patient with compromised hemodynamics and patients with probably reduced GFR. So diuretics are another elixirs or friends which can turn into poisons or force if used inappropriately in the intensive care unit. Once you have tried fluids and you have tried other uh, uh, methods of optimizing somebody's hemodynamics, the next thing you would like to do is to give vasopressors to these patients. So while norepinephrine and vasopressin have been shown to be effective, they have their own side effects. And trying to achieve a higher mean arterial pressure between patients who, who are already hypertensive in the community and trying to achieve a higher mean arterial pressure with the use of higher vasopressors is associated with a higher incidence of cardiac adverse effects as well as uh, vascular access related problems for these patients. 
the 65, 75, 85 study, which looked at targeting a mean arterial pressure of 65 versus 75 versus 85, clearly showed that the attempt to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 85 using a higher dose of vasopressors is detrimental, is associated with worse outcomes among critical ill patients and is more associated and is associated more often with cardiovascular side effects. So the elixir that is a vasopressor which is trying to defend your mean arterial pressure and therefore your uh, perfusion pressure across body systems be it cerebral perfusion pressure, coronary perfusion pressure or abdominal perfusion pressure. If you try to overdo it by pressing for a higher mean arterial pressure you could be causing more harm with the inappropriate use of an elixir called vasopressor and convert it into a poison. The other aspect which we need to understand and which has been an important aspect of uh, intensive care and pros and cons have gone into it is about the use of sedation. From deep sedation to no sedation, the yo-yo of sedation in the intensive care unit has swung wildly uh, to and fro over the last 10 years. What is appropriate sedation has to be tailored according to the clinical requirement of the patient and the safety of lightening that sedation. Too much of sedation, which is probably good in the basic context, if you give too much of it, it definitely increases the length of hospital stay, increases the morbidity of this patient, increases the incidence of hospital acquired ventilator associated infective complications and deep venous thrombosis and to cap it all, it increases the cost of delivery of intensive care. So appropriate use of sedation is probably good and that is what we need to practice by a daily meticulous administration of a validated sedation assessment scale or score and all nurses and ICU uh, professionals need to be aware of this and diligently apply these tools to avoid another elixir that is sedation which makes the process of delivery of intensive care more acceptable to the patient turn into a poison or a friend that can turn into a foe. When patients come into the intensive care unit and are on supports like mechanical ventilation and renal replacement therapy, we tend to feed them at different points of time. I've already spoken about the paradigm shifts in nutrition, but one thing is very clear. Over enthusiastic feeding of patients with excess amount of calories can become poisonous to these patients. Anybody who is given calories that are more than what he requires more than what his physiological state and pathophysiological state demands is likely to become hyperglycemic and then you get into this vicious cycle of trying to control the hyperglycemia with insulin and then you, you try to uh, push the insulin higher and that can actually turn poisonous to the patient. So calories need to be carefully tailored and we also know that hypocaloric feeding is an acceptable principle and hypocaloric feeding does not cause much harm to the patients. So while calories are essential for the sustenance of life of the patients in the intensive care unit, excess calories of more than 25 kilocalories per kilogram per day can turn, can turn the nutrition from an elixir or friend to a poison or foe. So a daily nutritional review, a discussion with the qualified nutritionist at the bedside and a judicious understanding about the patient's catabolic process versus his metabolic requirement is essential for preventing an essential aspect like calories from becoming poisonous to the patient. <clears throat> now comes the contentious aspect of the use of steroids. Steroids have played a major role in certain clinical situations. They are the mainstay for treating bronchial asthma. They are useful in uh, connective tissue crisis. They are used in uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemias. But in, in a, we have seen the havoc which inappropriate use of steroids can cause in intensive care patients during the two COVID pandemics. And we know uh, from past experience of transplant patients that mucor kills. So, and it produces, and steroids produce hyperglycemia. They produce high, myopathy. So, while steroids are an attractive aspect or an attractive alternative to handling some of the crisis problems in the intensive care unit, they themselves can cause harm. Will they have a role in the management of sepsis and septic shock? It still seems to be a definite yes, but at moderate doses. 
we have to remember that the target of 200 milligrams per day is probably the cap we need to understand and follow for managing patients with sepsis and septic shock. And when we give steroids for other indications like a lupus crisis for example, we need to understand the pros and cons. You need to weigh the risks and benefits of the uh, such a decision and understand that this elixir called steroid could turn into a foe if you don't monitor the requirement and taper them at the first opportunity. So this is another situation where an elixir can turn into a, a poison. So there are several such situations where uh, some of the elixirs of uh, what you use in the intensive care unit can turn into poison. Some of the antibiotics can cause problems to the patients. For example, you are using amiodarone to the patient. It is life-saving in the context of uh, um, arith ventricular arrhythmias. But if you are using it in a patient with a deranged hepatic function, you have to watch what it is doing to the QT interval. So there are several such things which nuances and uh, intricacies of using these so-called life-saving drugs in the intensive care unit, adrenaline for example, which have to be understood and which have to be applied at the bedside and that's what makes this field of intensive care so charming and so challenging to practice. I hope you agree with me on this issue. Thank you very much. Have a good day.